Safe Word with Jason Rouse. Hey, Jason Rouse here, and welcome to Safe Word Podcast. Uh, award winning, winning, or award winning filmmaker uh, Rob Jabaz. And Andrew Hunt, this is off to a choppy start, but uh, we're, we're going to find some legs uh, on this whole show. Um, Austin, Texas, with a couple of Canadians, can, is it slanderous to call us hosers? Is that correct? Is that, it would be considered a, is there some Facebook group that would be considered that a hate crime? I think you're aging yourself when you use the term hosers nowadays. I'm bringing it up. Could you put your mic up to your I'm, mouth I'm, first I'm, day I'm in show holding. business? I, yeah, <laughs> I, I, need to, I need to hear your breathing in and out. I don't know where this mic has been. Uh, but yeah, hosers, that's a very much Bob and Doug McKenzie term, right? Yeah. And uh, you don't hear any Canadian use that on a regular basis. I've never heard a Canadian actually use that other than Bob and Doug. That's true. Well, what is some... Uh, Politically charged Canadian, you know, what isms. Is, uh, anybody from Saskatchewan, right? What do you well, mean? As far as like lesser people. <laughs> oh, well, uh, let me tell you what, what you say, like what you call a Canadian, like the sort of the racist term for a Canadian mm. is, is Canadian. Canadian. Yeah. My Latino friends in California uh, call us snowbacks. Oh, okay. Well, does that work? That's just a little too clever. Canadian is yeah. just sort of like, I don't care enough about about the word to say it properly, mm. but you know what I mean. So it's like, yeah, that's enough, Canada. Uh, yeah. that, I, I've always felt like that's probably the best one I've heard so far. Canada. I've never even heard that before. Yeah. I want to see that on a shirt and see what kind of negative attention they get. Most Canadians really don't give a fuck. We don't really get offended over shit like that, do we? Well, take a look at uh, our prime minister. Uh, well, well, our prime minister, and let's let's first of all let's roll this back. I didn't know who the prime minister was for the first two years. I haven't paid attention to Canadian sports, uh, politics. Uh, the only thing I pay attention to is when the weather, when I'd have to return uh, in February and freeze my ass off in minus 35, dealing with Hamilton's brown snow. Uh, I know you guys are going to look down on me because I am from Hamilton. Isn't that a Toronto thing to do? I'm from Mississauga. Yeah, but what is Mississauga? A suburb of Toronto. Do you claim Toronto is the... I guess so. You're not going to go what? No, I say I say Mississauga to Canadians. I just thought you were from, from Austin when I first met you. So oh, I just really? Toronto. Yeah. Yeah, I do look kind of Austin-ish where I, it's kind of like a midlife crisis and a cry for help all at the same time. Yeah, like you got like uh, <laughs> silver fronts and stuff. Yeah. And a medallion. And a medallion, I had a, a friend of mine had made this for me. It helps me get a, a seat on the bus. Right. And that, and I rub my own shit on my face. But uh, let's not talk about my personal life. We're here in uh, Austin, Texas, where I live. You guys are clearly here for something better than this. Uh, and I thank you for uh, coming to my, uh, my underground bunker to uh, talk about uh, not only uh, what's happening right now, but Andrew and I... Um, had met probably late 90s in Toronto. Yeah. You would uh, come to a couple of my comedy shows at Yuck Yucks at Young and Eglinton there. And um, you would mention that you were in some entertainment industry. And uh, Alliance, Alli Alliance, Alliance? Alliance Atlantis is... Uh, at that time. Yeah, where I worked. But uh, yeah, when I first met you, it was... Uh, I had a friend in LA who was working with like... You know, this pre-YouTube uh, company, I think they were called Ant Films or something like that, and they were trying to get, get content, get content yeah. on the web. So, like, this is, like, late 90s, uh, so that all that stuff is just all very brand new. And they were looking for stand-up comedians, and so her and I went to an open mic night, and that's where we met you, yeah. where I met you. And, yeah, we stayed in touch all those all those years of... Uh, and then all, in 2000, like, you came to my Comedy Now tape. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. I'm distinctly coming off stage, seeing you and saying, I think we're going to do a horror movie together. Cut to Sudbury, Ontario. 20 in years October, later. October, 20 years later. Yeah. And a, and a thunderstorm and, a, and surrounded by crushed metal cars waiting to get electrocuted. I never felt more alive in my life. Everybody was nervous, but I've never really worked on a union job. So uh, it was very exciting for me. You guys had food and everybody was nice. It was very exciting. But... um. 
Let's talk about uh, that experience. <laughs> now, sure. be careful what you wish for. I know I said we're going to do a horror movie together, but, um, you know, I had some problems. Like the third day I got yelled at for leaving urine, uh, a cup of piss in one of the... Again, I'd never been in this this part of the industry. He, he didn't know that that wasn't commonplace. Just just pissing in a cup and leaving it lying in a trailer. You know, you just I where did, he grew I thought, up, that was like a regular thing. You know, you just well, kind of I mean, we've all done that before. Like, yeah. if, like I mean, I've ocean spray bottle. Sure. Like, I mean, I, one time I pissed in a bottle, like watching virtuosity starring denzel washington Ooh. just because like I'd, in the theater yeah yeah yeah. because i was <laughs> but i was the only one in the theater but i was just oh. like i was like i don't want to just piss on the floor i got this bottle here it was a gatorade bottle yeah you, you just got out pissed we're pissers hey listen we all there's do it people but, but but again the, the reality is that there was a washroom at the end of that trailer that you pissed in so you could have walked five feet and pissed okay. in an actual I, i'm gonna you know. go out on a limb here and say that you wouldn't complain about a lady that had a little toilet paper stuck on her pussy that, what in the the name of Christ are you talking about? <laughs> Look, he's a, a bit of a prude, uh -huh. right? Oh, oh, trust me, I don't, don't, don't let these golden locks fool you. <laughs> no, but the fact that you're offended by the the piss oh, party, I'm not, I'm not offended. I'm just merely saying that there was a toilet five feet away. But it's the adventure of it of maybe sure, getting caught. It's like, is he peeing in the bottle or is he fucking the bottle? And it wasn't a bottle. It was, I believe, it was a uh, coffee cup, right? Who pissed in? Oh, yes, it was a paper coffee right. cup. Right, so if you're fucking a paper coffee cup, <laughs> my God, what the fuck are you you hanging with, Like you dealing I'm with down the there? Road. <laughs> I'm on the road. A knotted sock just doesn't cut it on those lock weekends. For sure. Did you, did, were you like... <laughs> like you, using the the ocean spray bottle to to like like as sort of like a what do you call that like a fifi towel like a like a fleshlight kind of but, but then like you know you have the mentality of like a, of a 12 year old so you think you're supposed to like pee inside the girl mm. you know because it's like that's how you get a girl pregnant you put you put your your wiener inside her hoo-ha and then you fucking pee in her you know but everybody knows now that's how you keep a girl wet <laughs> is pee in her right am i doing it right yeah totally no. that's that's great that he has that kind of self-control because usually there's like sort of an organic valve mechanism within within the male uh you know organ that mm. uh, that controls like uh, like jizz or piss exactly there's a lane change but right. when you're sexually unattracted to somebody and you're just inside of them out of spite you can pee you can pee yeah i i don't have that lane change i can go fully you can pee fully and you can pee hard yep yeah, but how do you get it out? Do you do a handstand in front of the urinal? That's 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 the difficulty. Yeah, yeah is you that you know, like if if you wake up, like sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night. Yeah, and you wake up with a heart on, you know, as as men do, and you got to piss, and it's not you, yours. you literally you, you have to sit on the toilet and kind of lean forward. Sure. at least I do to, to yeah. have to get it in there and get it uh, without spraying everywhere. A, a friend of mine just, actually just said, go into the shower and just just let her rip. I, I, I could do that too. <laughs> just go into the I shower, let her rip. Too. Forget yeah. about it. Deal with it in the morning. But then now you're, you're in the shower and now you've got the confidence of just letting loose. So now you're just pissing up in front of your mouth. See, now, now we're getting into like, you know, a copyright infringement on the 40-year-old virgin. Is that what happened? And, there was and, a piss yeah, and the boner? Op opening scene, he's just waking up with like, you know... Morning wood. Like, you know, extreme angry boners. And, uh, and he's like peeing up, you know, and that's the gag, you know. So, mm. I, you know, I, I tread lightly. We don't want to get into yeah, involved no, in the lawsuit. Yeah, no, I don't want to... Hey, can I bring up the fact that I think something was taken from me and oh, put yeah. it in a movie? Get out where? An yeah. Adam Sandler movie. One of my jokes ended up... They... they tweaked the word a bit but it was so blatant i've never really uh addressed it but uh there was a joke about putting uh, a wig on your ass um and uh putting lipstick on your asshole put lipstick on your asshole and a wig that's so a classic jason so, so it looks like you're blowing me while i'm fucking you yeah well they changed it to glasses oh yeah but that yeah. happens that that was a big problem at the comedy stores a lot of failed uh sitcom writers would sit at the back of the room of the store and fish for sketches and stuff. For and sure. There, there was some problems with Saturday Night Live writers poaching uh, stand-up comedians' um, material to, to end up in monologues. And but stuff. Just, they just steal them from podcasts now. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, so see, but that's, that's, that's the problem with creativity in general. It's like you can come up with an idea and you think, oh, I've got an original idea. Mm. And then you haven't even told anybody about it. And then like three, four months later, you see that same sort of idea... Someone's releasing a movie about it. It's like it's it's out there in the ether, yeah. And it's like it's just really kind of first to the gate. You know How what I mean? Sometimes. How does that feel when you spent six months writing a script and a third of it is 
already been treaded over with some other project that's either in the works or you've never really discovered. That, Fucking deal with it. Like, what yeah. are you going to do, cry about it? It's not fair, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, they didn't steal it from you because obviously you've not shown it to anybody. Mm-hmm. So just... Yeah, you can't cry. You can't. I, I have mean, comics, move, move com- forward. Comics, there's so many comedians, they get a little joke and they coddle it. And I'm like, that baby is meant to die. Well, but, but this, like with scripts, you come up with an idea for a film and an idea is one thing, but it's, it's the characters, it's uh, the beats, it's oh, yeah. the, the subtext, it's the subplots, it's all these other things that really make it what it is. And so I'm sure it's the same thing with a joke. You can have it's a condensed. similar joke as yeah. somebody else, but it's how you tell it. It's how, uh, you, you know, you, uh, I guess play out the story with the audience and then how you throw the punchline. Like, sure. ah, you know, it's, it's you, your flavor on it, right? You, you can own it. And, uh, but again, like you were saying, like, I, sometimes I, I find if anything is leaning in that direction, I cut that lane off immediately and, and go somewhere else because me trying to uh, figure out how to make something work that's really already kind of been played out in some form or another, especially when things are done on television, that's kind of like documentation regardless whether or not you had been doing the joke in your club act and somebody's done something similar to that in a stand-up performance. That happened to Jeremy Hotz, actually. Yeah. Uh, his roommate did his entire act on The Tonight Show. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> his roommate did his set on The Tonight Show, and he told Jeremy, he goes, look, you're Canadian. You're not going to be here that long anyway. So Motherfucker. Right. But that happened. When, when, when was this? I, I, oh, I, probably 20 plus years ago. Jamie, uh, uh, Jeremy had just moved to LA around okay. that time. Yeah. I, I, I worked with Jeremy like really early on. Jeremy and Brian. Uh, Hart? Brian Hart. Yeah. Brian, uh, back when Brian was like writing for Kids in the Hall. Mm-hmm. Uh, him and Jeremy were, were trying to do a, a talk show kind of thing in Toronto. Yeah. And we shot it at, uh, and so I, I kind of shot the pilot for them. Uh, and we shot at a comedy club on. Uh, it wasn't Yuck Yucks. It was the one club that was like the non Yuck Yucks Comedy club. Comedy Wood, Laugh Resort, Laugh Resort. Yeah, and 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 because that was also when Brian was uh, kind of in his fuck Yuck Yucks uh, period. Yeah. yeah, in the late eighties, there was that division where the uh, L A. and New York and Toronto they tried to form unions. To yeah, protect the comedians, and uh, there was all kinds of shit. Some guy had committed suicide at the comedy store. He jumped on off the hotel, Jesus. and fucking flopped out. Um, and, uh, yeah, enough about suicidal comedians. <laughs> well, let's, let's go back to you pissing in the cup. So you're lucky it was, uh, we don't need, at- to, we don't need to go back to that. Come on. <laughs> well, no. how, how much do you want to talk about him pissing for? <laughs> well, I don't know. That's, that's what, what are you drinking there? We're going to, you no, don't I mean, know about this not, show. You got to piss in that I'm not, cup. I'm not. You know, worried about like it's not like I'm grossed out or offended or anything. No, it's just like the, I don't think the people out there in Radio Land want to hear about this guy pissing in a cup for like more, more than surprised. we talked about. It. We just met. There's a laundry. Li- I got a whole Mailchimp account set up to get, send my piss videos out. They call me the asparagus kid online. Uh-huh. That's my alias. But um, yeah, no, no, yeah. I peed. Look, mm-hmm. first of all, let's wrap this one up. We're talking I got, about it. I was nervous, and anything that I didn't want to be was late to set. And when I come out to use the restroom shortly before our call time, I could see that there was 20 people in front of the pisser. I'm not going to make that lineup and get the set on time. So I pissed in a paper cup, put it up on the shelf. The, um, and they moved us down one the next day. I didn't know. I thought we got our little uh, same trailer. Yeah, same for the entire. Uh, this, is where my, this is my house. No, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know you move papers along and it. Anyway, she got my room, and I forgot the thing, but the urine had lifted the glue off the seam of the cup, so, so it was dripping. And I could, first of all, I know when, especially women, when you hear, Jason, it's, <laughs> the hair comes up on the back. I know that I'm fucking guilty of whatever it is. It's all in tone. And uh, yes, was my answer. She goes, is this piss? Is this piss? Oh, it's piss. Oh my God, it's leaking. It's piss. It's piss. And I look out the door and she pours out a, a super big gulp urine sample. She, she poured it. She poured it out where? Uh, out in front of her steps <clears throat> as more of a protest to me of but my like, bad behavior. Was it onto pavement or was it onto like gravel? Or was gravel, it? yeah. Okay, so here's what you should have done. You, sh- you should have taken a piss in the cup yeah. and then 
dumped it out onto the gravel immediately instead of saving it like some kind of... I didn't want anyone to see me pour out piss because everyone was walking. I didn't want anybody to know that I urinated during the course of this thing. I was terrified. Just, I mean, you know, here's the thing. Maybe it's the comic, you know, the comic in you, like you think everyone's watching you, but no one gives a shit if some guy pouring some sort of liquid out, you know? Could have just been like a cup of... uh, a cup of water that you had thrown some cigarettes into. You know? I'm going to need coffee. you to speak in court on my behalf. Well, let's, uh, you know, I was actually almost ready to defend you because you, because you were giving, you were giving the context. <laughs> the gravel? You were, no, you, you were giving the context of like the lineup and I was just like, there you go. Like, I mean, that's a perfectly reasonable reason mm. to, to take a piss in a cup. However, where you fucked up is by not immediately dealing with it, you know, because you I can't, you, the, what, my the, nervousness got the best of me. The issue is you're pull, right. Is pulling I out your Johnson, it. pulling out your Johnson in public, and urinating is something that you can't do in public. However, you can just you know do do what you need to do in private, and then eliminate the evidence. All of a sudden, you've you've completely um, you've completely absolved yourself. Sloppy. Yeah, you absolved yourself of any kind of guilt or blame, and uh, and then you know we wouldn't have to have this fucking conversation. Or I could have drank it. That's true. You could have done that. I could have drank it. Wouldn't have been that bad. It wouldn't have been the first time, and yeah. I've done it for nothing. Yeah, that, you know what I mean. Yeah, they call that the the foamy delight. Yeah, it did have a bit of a latte froth on the top of it. I push hard. You know, I piss aggressively. That's probably why the seam was loose in the cup. Because <laughs> you, it wasn't even it wasn't dissolved. It was just you actually forced it by the pressure of your piss. Yeah, my urethra. You, I could pass out a roll of dimes. That's how the diameter of it is. Oh, it, it seems it seems to me like the more narrow it would be, the more pressurized it would be. That's the thing, though. But so what are you, what are you saying to me right now? I'm telling you that I piss. It, how it, narrow or wide is your urethra? It's okay. You see the end of this? Yeah. It's about half the size of that. Oh God! There's fucking it, clam it, chowder coming out of there. Just no, like, blah, blah, I don't. Blah, blah. I don't have it. It's not like that. It's just. It, it looks like a, a rat throwing up into a bathtub. <laughs> was when I pissed into a bathtub. Yeah. <laughs> have you ever seen those videos though of, of like yes. going like the extreme porn sites and the guys are like putting things in their piss holes? Oh, fuck. I've seen rodents. I, I saw a guy mm. who a woman was wearing stiletto heels mm. and he had a board over him and she was basically stepping. She was putting the, the heel yeah. of the stiletto in his piss hole yeah. and, and blood was coming yeah. out. I don't, how the fuck do you find that uh, uh, invigorating or in any way whatsoever? There's, you know, different strokes for different folks. No, absolutely. It's crazy though. There's so many levels to it. Like when you're bleeding, like, okay. Bru- uh, out of your ma- piss hole? Yeah. I have concerns for long-term effects of oh, for sure. having your genitals stomped into a gravy. You know, uh-huh. have you seen the Pain Olympics? No. Have you seen the Pain Olympics? Negative. So was that our commercial break? That was our commercial break. The the Pain Olympics is and we're back. The worst montage of uh, horror. Just guys cutting their dicks off with wood chisels. Yeah. Uh, uh, like like a murder. chisel and a hammer. Yeah. Oh wow, that's a. That's a weird way to do it. I would think that probably scissors would be like the most, uh, you know, easy kind of uh, efficient way to cut it off. But like I, a wood chisel is meant for, you know, s- stone, right? Yeah. On a hard surface, though, you're going to get a clean. I don't know, because you got to do a sawing. You, you've got to. Can you cut through your dick with one swoosh? I don't know. I think if so. the knife was sharp enough, yeah, sure. Absolutely. It, but but I, 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 saw, <clears throat> I saw one guy, he was. Uh, using a steak knife mm. to like stab through his his butt cheeks. And, yeah, and it was kind of like he was fucking his butt cheek with a steak knife. Yeah, there was what, what what's that site? Uh, there's one Rotten. extreme. Com, yeah, but there's one it's extreme good. site, and they just got all this just weird fucking shit. Live Leak was like that, but they got shut down. Oh, couple, didn't they? Yeah, there mm-hmm. was always terrible things on. But I get sent because of this style of uh, comedy that I do. I'm constantly bombarded with hor- pure horror and uh do you guys pull from any of that when you're doing these kind of horror films are we going to talk about horror films now we are totally going right. to talk well, about we, we, horror were, films. we were heading in that direction right okay. from the get-go um I, I don't want to sound impatient but i was just like a little bit taken aback by like how how free-formed this podcast <laughs> is you know I, I was just like i haven't even hit record I mean, yet <laughs> oh jesus christ yeah, yeah, that was- <laughs> i was gonna say that um well you know at any time you want hit record i was just gonna say that like you know, I, I like to think of myself as the kind of guy who, you know, likes to go with the flow. Yeah. But I mean, 
we need structure and rules for things to happen. Well, you this know? isn't Spotify, but uh, anywho. Right. The, the structure, you guys live in structure and rules to uh-huh. get certain outcome. Right. But my thing is chaos. Yeah, and then something will kind of grow out of it. Yeah. Got it. I'll work with that when we land on it, but I don't even know what, how far that is away. Right. Well, you know, you know let me... Uh, let me just uh, take the reins for a second here. Sure, right. And Andrew, um, so do you ever pull from like, you know, uh, internet sort of uh, internet gore sites or or sort of these kinds of live leaks sort of things when you're making films, like for ideas or like gore scenes and stuff? No, I, I, have, I haven't pulled from any of that <laughs> myself. Uh, I, I have pulled from a, like a documentary I saw once, but uh, about uh, my first film, uh, I saw a documentary on the sex trade in Toronto and uh, was inspired by that, but I've never pulled from uh, any of that kind of really, yeah, things. All right, that, that was a failure. Let's go back. Let's go back yeah. to the to the chaos. random chaos thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was uh, sorry. That was no, but have no. you have you pulled from it? Oh, okay, uh, well, no, actually, uh, I've not from that kind of stuff. Um, mostly, I just, uh, uh, for example, like in my film, the sadness. Uh, there's um, there's a scene where these kids pick up a, another kid, another, well, their teacher actually, and they wrap barbed wire around like a basketball pole and they like, they use his crotch as a battering ram to kind mm. of smash his nuts. And the idea for that actually came from an old Taiwanese uh, prank that, that kids in like junior high play on each other. Where it's called an aluba. And what they do is um, they do exactly that minus the barbed wire. Okay. Like, I was, I, yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, th- that was more just, um, you know, kind of like a cultural like I just wanted, I wanted the local audience to kind of be like, "Oh, look, it's an aluba," you know. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then the Western audience might uh, be like, "Oh, that's uh, that's interesting." And then maybe if they look a little deeper, they'll find out that it's like a it's a prank that's, uh, you know, sort of uh, how do you say that? Like kind of coded in in Taiwan, like a like a local Taiwanese sort of thing. Because it, it really is. I mean, you don't really choose what's part of your culture. Like you're, whatever what you do is what your parts is what's part of your culture it's right? fun when you pay attention enough to pull those things out of your back pocket and go oh yeah i know exactly what's going on over here but i'm putting a little bit of me on top of this mm-hmm. so they have like it, it resonates more when you take childhood uh torture games and incorporate them with bob wire in front of a so yeah screen. because because we you know you have you'll have ex, you maybe you personally have experience with that so it kind of will resonate with yeah. you. Hey let me ask you something. Did you ever um did Red Green ever do stand up? No, but he did come to my school, Steve Smith. Yeah. Uh I'm a huge fan. I like Red Green. Yeah. What what a what a he yeah, I'm a fan, you know, all of his Smith and Smith and the sitcom <clears throat> Mac and Me or whatever it was. He had a sitcom with his wife and his sons. Oh, I don't, I, I don't it wasn't know. very good, but Red I only knew Green. The, the Red Green show. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, I mean, if the women don't find you handsome, at least they'll find you handy. handy, right? And then you show them a duct tape, whatever. No, it was great. Him and Harold playing keyboards. Yeah, or it was like a video keyboard, like a yeah, like a With video effects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. and he'd do this fake uh, CBC '80s kind of, and then they'd pull up a, yeah. a screen of sorts. I mean, like t- to be honest, folks, almost unwatchable. I couldn't get, really? I couldn't get through the, the Red Green show pretty much ever. I always tried to give it a shot because I think in, in Canada they played it before The Simpsons. Yeah. And it was just like, oh, I'm a little early. Well, let's try to give Red Green show a shot. And it's just like, yeah. uh, this isn't working out. Maybe we'll try to play Simon's Quest or something. See, I loved, I was such a huge fan of uh, House of Frankenstein. Well, House of Frankenstein for sure. But that's, that's a classic. I love the, the, look, the Red Green show, there was very, like, it was the most hee haw set you've ever seen it, it was just very simple and character driven you know what i like i like those black pardon me i like those black and white segments you know the, how they do the black and white segment yeah the hunting segments yeah yeah those ones were the funny voiceover yeah those were great yeah, yeah yeah okay those were good those were good yeah come on i just always i always <laughs> kind of felt that there's a lot of canadian tv shows that tried to make fun of canadian culture but like not canadians don't even care yeah exactly yeah, yeah. you know um so I don't know for me other than uh, um, uh, fuck Air SC- fu- SCTV yeah you know which kind of played with like you know they made fun of both they made fun of the Canadian culture and American culture and uh, just you know pop culture at large they made fun of but uh, for me it was the kids in the hall I thought they were the kind of yeah the uh, the the best Canadian uh, comedy show sure of of their time I'll agree. Like, I mean, that I think that even if you talk to comedians at the time, like if you talk to like, you know, 
Mike Myers, for example. Yeah. Like oh, he'll, yeah. he'll tell you, he'll yeah. be like kids in the hall where like, like I wanted to be on kids in the hall and, yeah. and I was actually kind of bummed out when they didn't want me to uh, uh. be a part of them. And then I ended up doing Saturday Night Live and, and that led to like his, you know, fortuitous uh, career. You yeah. Know? And what, what's funny is a couple <clears throat> of the kids in the hall did Saturday Night Live and they didn't really, uh, Mark McKinney, Mark McKinney Mark was McKinney on there, and, yeah. and Bruce McCullough, yeah. and, and they didn't really excel on was that. Was Bruce McCullough on Saturday Night Live? I believe yeah. he was, yeah. Huh. For a minute. And yeah. but, uh, then he directed uh, and was on a bunch of uh, Larry Sanders. Yeah, then he, he, he did a feature, uh, Dog Park, um, yeah, I remember which I that. saw at TIFF a while ago. And then, of course, uh, Dave Foley was on... Uh, News Radio. News Radio, which is funny. It goes back to what we're talking about, Brian Hart. I was uh, in Toronto, I think, in, uh, sorry, in L.A. in 1999, and saw the Tragically Hip were playing at uh, House of Blues. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, no, I know. But I, 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 <laughs> I'm on with you on that one, too. Yeah, no, I, 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 was never, I was never a fan, still aren't a fan. But I had done some uh, music videos and stuff for the, the same label and the same uh, record man, uh, band management. Mm -hmm. So um, Jake Gold was the manager's name. Anyways, so, you know, I'm in L.A., Tragically Hip are playing at House of Blues. Fuck, got to go see it. And uh, I bump into Brian Hart there at the show. <laughs> and anyways, uh, Dave Foley comes up and hammered. He's there. No, but I'm talking to Brian, uh, and and I don't know anybody else other than Brian. And and Dave Foley was like, "Who are you?" And I'm like, uh, you know. <laughs> I'm and he goes, nobody. "Okay, you can fuck off now." And <laughs> he nice. said that too. Yeah. And that was that was my uh, and that was actually the second time I met him. I met him like you know maybe a few years earlier <laughs> when he came. To <laughs> you got Sheridan told College. off by yeah. kids in the hall. Yeah, Dave Foley. Uh, and so I was like, oh, okay, yeah. So I'll just leave then. You should have fucking kicked his ass. You should have jumped on him. Yeah. Now I don't understand. I know Dave used to get hammered. Right. A lot. Okay. And uh, you might have caught him. At one of those moments. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that a weird thing? That's why I never it, went It is, to... because, like, you know, like, I was a fucking huge fan. I loved the dude. I loved Kids in the Hall. I loved News Radio. And then, like, when he, when a guy that you really like yeah. tells you to fuck off, and it's yeah. like, wow, okay. And not that you were seeking to be in that company. No. You were brought over. I, I, I knew Brian. I, I, it's not like I was just, like, you know, like some wannabe hanging on. Sure. Yeah. I got a good one when I was in Locarno a little while ago. Actually, before I say that this thing, um, how about uh, Scott Thompson on, on Hannibal? Yeah. Like he's probably the most successful kid in the hall, right? Yeah. For like graduating to Hannibal. Mm -hmm. Anyways. Interesting. Yeah, uh, Scott's so great. Further. I, I did drugs with him at the MTV Awards with Tom Green. It what, was what, one of my what, favorite things. What kind of drugs? Uh, I think I was doing rowdy powder and they were smoking weed. Oh, so you, so you were doing drugs alone? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but, and I offered Scott uh, a little bit of a snifter and yeah. he says, oh, no, I sucked too many dick and did too much coke during Kids in the Hall. That's anyway. so funny how you're like, I was doing drugs with them. Like you're, you're kind of, you're, 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 you're throwing them under the bus and then you're like, well, actually I was just doing drugs. With them. I was just you doing, were doing drugs, drugs beside them. Beside them. Yeah. yeah. That's what I do. I don't drink alcohol. Okay. Do you drink alcohol? Uh, I, I enjoy a snifter of port at Christmas. Okay. It's a, a seasonal thing for you, but you don't get blackout drunk and try and fight the cops and piss no. your pants. No, 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 no. no. Uh, but, but I will, I, will um, I, I drink. You know, I, I, like last night I was at the, at the highball there at, close to the Alamo and I, uh, Alamo Draft House rather. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was drinking. I, I drink. I'm just joking. The snifter of port at Christmas is a, a Simpsons reference for all yeah. the Simpsons fans out there. But I wanted to tell you that at Locarno, I met Abel Ferreira, the director of uh, Driller Killer and King of New York. Miss yeah. 45. Oh, yeah, yeah. Miss 45, absolutely. And he gave me one, like, I went up. Uh, Bad to, Lieutenant. I just, uh, Bad Lieutenant, the, the Harvey <laughs> Keitel one. Yeah. I was going to say that. Um, well, the other one doesn't count. I don't I, I Are you fucking kidding me? That's way better. I, no way. Yes, it is. No way. <laughs> Dude, the, the original. The original is better. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't watch. The uh, Herzog one. No. I had to fucking turn it off no. and walk away. That, it, okay, so let's just agree to disagree on this Fine. one. But uh, 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 but I was going to say that um, uh, I went up to Abel Ferreira to just kind of be like, because he's, he's there. It's not like I'm a huge fan, but I mean, I love Driller Killer. Yeah, it's right there. Yeah, yeah. And How I, you doing? I, I just go over and I'm just like, hey, Mr. F Mr. Ferreira, I just wanted to let you know that uh, I really love Driller Killer. And, he go, and he's like, he looks at me, he's just like, oh, fuck. You know, like kind of just yeah. like, like, oh, like laughing, kind of like, that's what you're going to fucking, that's what you're going to fucking all the things. Uh, bring up. You have all the things. That's kind of the thing, right? And I was just like, uh, like uh, and he just turns over like to the girl next to the next to him and starts like whispering something. And then she starts laughing. And I'm just kind of like, like, this is kind of funny. Like I'm kind of getting... Uh, you know, roasted. Uh, yeah, getting a little, getting a little roasted by Abel Ferreira, but like a, an elderly Abel Ferreira, right? And then he turns, he turns back to me, and uh, and he's just like, so you know, what, what, what do you want? And I'm just like, 
uh, sorry, sir. I just I wanted just to say that uh, you know I, I liked your film. I, I don't really get to talk to uh, celebrities very often, you know. And he goes, I, I say the same thing when I look at myself in the mirror when I'm shaving. You know, I, <laughs> I only get to see celebrities very often. Ah, I'd say to the same girl, like ah, ah, ah. she's laughing. He's like, okay, get out of here. And I was just like, okay, thanks, sir. Bye bye. Right. And I left. And uh, but I was like, that was cool, you know. Like, yeah, that was <laughs> no, cool. No, that could be cool. Yeah, because because he's an like, autograph doesn't count all the I, time. I would have preferred him act like that to act like that rather than be like friendly to me. Totally, you know. Um, and uh, that that was pretty much the only like encounter with a celebrity that I that I've had like in my entire life. Okay, really? Yeah. Wow. Ex- well, hold on. Uh, one time I saw the guy who played Nightcrawler in the in the original <laughs> X Men, like uh-huh. X Men Part Two or whatever, like the one that was directed by that pedophile guy. Yeah. Um, uh, but but the guy who played yeah the guy who played the Nightcrawler guy with the blue makeup, mm-hmm. I saw him at a party in in uh, Vancouver one time and he was way shorter than I thought he was. He was like, he was like up to like my Skinny. fucking nipples. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Nick Holtz. I don't know what his name is, but he, he's also Nicholas in Holt. Goldeneye. Mm. Uh, yeah. He, Nicholas Holt. Is that what his yeah, name is? Very... Yeah. Brit- British dude. Yeah. He's very pointy. Yeah. yeah. I, I like to, I just like to think of him as like uh, that pointy guy, like Nightcrawler. Yeah. A lot or, of or pointy dude. Right angles. Yeah. Nicholas, and, and he was dating uh, Jennifer I'd say Lawrence more, for a while. If, I you, if you follow that. I wouldn't say uh, right angles. Culture. I'd say more like acute angles. Yeah. Yeah, but definitely not obtuse angles. Obtuse? Yeah. I went to school in Hamilton. I uh-huh. can't spell obtuse. Well, obtuse is, is l- larger than 90 degrees, and acute is uh, below 90 degrees. Okay. So, you know, you learn something new every day. That's Thank what you. this so, podcast is for. Nic- yeah, education. Nic- Nicholas Holt, uh, great British actor. Actually, I, I had a chance to talk to him, because uh, when I was trying to get uh, my third film, Fight Machine, off the ground, uh, I was working with a producer in L.A., and the script managed to get into Nicholas Holt's hands. And so, you know, I had a, a, a email conversation with the dude. He said, I love the script, but it's just, uh, you know, I don't see myself in that character. So he was a nice dude. But on, on that note, now that you've made the sadness mm-hmm. and, you know, you, you, the, the film is doing phenomenal uh, and you're working on your second film, but as, you know, like as you now have like these aspirations as a director, mm-hmm. you don't have to follow the hand. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> but are there like actors now that you would love to work with? Who would be a dream of yours? Oh, that's a good question. Pick five. Oh, wow. That's way too Your many. Dream way too many. Team. Is it? But yeah, but say, you know, two or three. Like, who would you fucking love to you, work with? You can with? put them on, you, you can lower them on the film, even though their pay scale is all superstars, but you get to put them anywhere on the food chain. I wish there were more like, I wish there were more like, like, uh, Steven Yuen's, you know? I wish there were more just kind of like good, versatile like Asian actors mm. because um, I, I have an idea for a script right now that is about kind of like uh, we call them like ABCs like American born Chinese in, in Taiwan like people who who are from America but maybe their families from Taiwan yeah, and they, they kind of move back there to yeah. kind of like um, and I, I've always been interested in that that uh, well not always I mean mm. this is hardly something that I've always been interested in but it's something that I do think is interesting is sort of this idea of being kind of like connected to like you're, you're like, you have roots, but you're not really like as connected to them. And also kind of this idea too, that like you, you don't really fit in because people in Taiwan kind of expect, like they'll talk to you and they'll talk to you in Chinese. And then you'll kind of, maybe your Chinese isn't quite as good because you've grown up, you've, you've grown up in America. So maybe you have kind of like a weird accent or something. Yeah. So I've just kind of always thought like, this is kind of an interesting thing to, to talk about. And also sort of on the other hand too, like the, the Caucasian guy who moves to Taiwan and, and you know, he, revels in the culture well no he he gets like a girlfriend and then maybe if they get married like how depending on the relationship like how uh accepting is her and and her family really like and if they have kids um how how does that dynamic play out like is is she gonna like like he's gonna if he doesn't speak Chinese like really well is he gonna be like the weird dad who like you know like in school is like oh your yeah. dad's weird he can't even speak Chinese properly yeah. you know and then like sort of he, the kid will gravitate more towards the mother who is like oh yeah mom's like mom's more like me like she's she's the normal one so like it, it, sometimes like the dad will kind of feel like he's like the the less loved one of the family yeah so I, I this is kind of the the I mean it's a horror film and there's all the good stuff the gore and all that stuff but you have to kind of create uh some human subtext in order for like the film to be worth making. Right. Mm. But anyways, uh, the actors that I, that I would like to work with, um, took, took a long time to get there. Well, you know, whatever we're, we're talking about yeah. stuff. Um, I just wish that there were more like, like, um, there just aren't, aren't very many notable, like commanding, like 
Asian American like actors. Brendan Lee would probably maybe be one of the best examples. He's he's what? he's deceased. He's R- yeah, I know. R.I.P. But you could pick the dead guys. Well, no, he's also he's also only half Asian. Yeah, but he's a great actor. Like yeah, in, in, in well, he, Showdown in Little Tokyo. He was one of those no, guys. Bro, come on, man. Well, yeah, yeah, but but he, he, he was one of those respect. guys who was like yeah. on his way up, and then of yeah. course just got. You know, what a the shame. accident happened. Uh, yeah, totally. But okay, well, what, what about like North American actors, uh, British actors, any any actors from around the world? Who would you who would you want to work with? I don't know, man. Like, I, it it really for me it depends entirely bah, on bah, like bah, bah, bah. it depends entirely on the character. You know, like uh, oh god, like I I don't really know. Like, who, who who what actors do I like the best? I don't. The I, Rock. The Rock, like, yeah, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Yeah, I mean, he's not even an actor. He's like, he's like a, a movie star, you know. The, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, no, he's that's that's it. He's he's not a like versatile Lud- actor. Like Ludacris. Yeah. <laughs> like 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 yeah like Ludacris. Yeah, that's a, that's a good uh, comparison. He's not an actor. He's a movie star. But like 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 yeah. like a Ben Kingsley. Would you ever want to work with like someone like Ben Kingsley, like who's like Gandhi me, three, a, a true fucking actor? Like Isn't the guy funny can how play they, anything. They got they got Ben Kingsley to play like an Indian man. Like yeah, like, a little you know? fucked up. Well, but he's kind of that funny. good. Yeah, exactly. He's like Robert Downey Jr. in uh, Tropic Trump Thunder. Thunder. Yes, yes. Um, I don't know. Like I honestly, Robert I'm, Downey Jr. would be maybe in the top ten. No, no, nah, because the thing is, is like these these guys are. They, they carry their, they carry their reputation with them. To He's the, always Iron Man. Well, well, not not just that, but like you know, to me, people like Robert Downey Jr. always play Robert Downey Jr. Like like he's a great actor, but like you, you don't really see him like. His uh, early stuff was pretty broad. But you don't really see him outside of like really kind of who he is. Or even even like De Niro, like fuck, De Niro's awesome. But to me, he's always kind of playing De Niro, whether it's a comedy or a drama or whatever. Clint Eastwood. He's, you know, but, but a guy like Ben Kingsley is truly an actor who, uh, or Anthony Hopkins, who... No, they Anthony, Anthony Hopkins s- always always plays Anthony Hopkins. Do you I'd think say. so? I, I believe that that's... Maybe, well, maybe, you know what, here's, here's a good example. Uh, like Al Pacino... When he did The Godfather, was I felt like he was more of like an actor, but now he's just like I'm Al Pacino. Yeah. I'm always like this all the time, you know. And it's like, when did that happen? Because it's like you watch Godfather one and two, and you're like, and you're like, okay, this guy's a good actor, and you watch like Scarface. Uh, yeah, maybe that's the kind of the beginnings of it. But then, but just to stay on the Godfather tip, it's like Godfather one and two. It's like okay, this is an actor playing Michael Corleone, and then like. And then all of a sudden, it's like Godfather Three, and he's like, "I'm Michael Corleone." Like he's he's Al Pacino now, you know? It's yeah. Like, it's so it's grating, and I hate. And then he's like that for every other movie, Devil's Advocate, Heat, everything else. He's just like that Al Pacino, and and I guess that's kind of the way I feel about Anthony Hopkins because like you, you watch The Elephant Man, and it's like okay, this is an actor, mm-hmm. but now now he's just ever since Silence of the Lambs, like I think that uh, Anthony Hopkins has just always been that kind of guy, you know? Look at what happened to Gilligan. From Gilligan's Island, yeah, he What's, couldn't get a job because well, that, everyone was well, typecast Gilligan. Yeah, well, yeah, but and, and that was that was back in the old days. Or same with uh, Adam West. You know, he played Batman and he, he gets uh, typecast. But mm. uh, yeah, you know who's a good actress is that um that that lady from uh, Hereditary. Ooh, what's her name? It's like um it's like it's like a Tony. Yeah, yeah, Tony uh, Collette. Collette. Yeah, Tony Collette. She's I think she's really great. Um, yeah, but I don't really have anything that I could think of that I would want to like write for her. I I just you know what I like? I like finding people who, like who don't really have a lot of um a resume, but then I'll but if they show up and I talk with them and I feel like they can do it, then I like I think I like that better because um that's just what we did kind of with the sadness. Like everybody was pretty much just like a a, a, a green actor and uh, we just put them in the situation and um how does that work in costing you dollars? Uh, I mean, I, did, I don't handle the finances. You yeah, know? but it it was pretty. Uh, I would imagine it was pretty cost effective. Because like, yeah. What, what what was your? How many shooting days did you have for twenty eight? Twenty eight. That's yeah. fucking wow. That's we, fast. We we had eighteen on spare parts and eighteen on on the fight machine, which is insane. It was fourteen, but I added another four days of my bullshit to the project. Right. Uh, you added four days of of pissing days. Piss days. Yeah. Piss days. Piss days, and uh, just trying to stay out of trouble. I got yelled at for smoking pot. 
Sorry, I was told because Canada had just gone legal right. across the country. Yeah, but so you're not you're not supposed to like you know be pounding beers on set. I don't drink, but I was just ripping joints yeah, in no, between but, scenes. Yeah, but <laughs> just because it's legal doesn't oh, mean. It, yeah, yeah. See, this, it, 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 his I don't eyes know. were as big as fucking glass plates. Like they were just I was big. High. Uh-huh. Andrew put his hands on my shoulder. No, but at that me, was. Are you on drugs? And yeah. I said, I have no the, the, shoes. The, the, the first day that we we shot with him he came on set so fucking high couldn't remember his lines it was the first time i as a director had ever experienced that before and it 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 throws you for a loop but that actually like you know to your credit uh i learned from that as a director because that's that's the thing is like when you're directing everything that can go wrong will fucking go wrong and you got to deal with it and you either you deal with it either like you you, you sail that stormy yeah. sea or you fucking sink yeah and and you know i'm not saying that uh, spare parts is a masterpiece in any way but it's like you know you deal with the shit and you make the best that you can with the shit that you're dealt with you know and so shooting a film in 18 days is, is in, insane 28 days I, those extra 10 days fuck i would love that mm-hmm. do, do they have uh, a lot of working with actors in canada can be a bitch with the union and I, I shouldn't say that I fucking hate the union, but I do. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, they do get in the way of things like shit, like, you know, you want your crowd to uh, all chant, uh, you know, along with uh, a line of dialogue and they can't do that because as soon as they start chanting, you got to pay every single one of them an actor's fee. Right. So they're no longer extras. Do you, do you, did you run into any kind of those kind of complications no, no, with because yours? Ta- Taiwan is, I think um, has a fairly, fairly like anti-union sort of uh culture uh and um that's one of the reasons why we were able to to do the film for such a low budget um and um can i ask you what that would cost in canadian dollars nah i uh i don't want to uh yeah it's it's i would tell you but it like just sort of at this stage of the of the sort of the selling process of, of the course, film, of course. But, but but also it, it also doesn't translate like no. even like even if you spend a million dollars canadian on it yeah the reality is that if, if you're paying you're not having to pay like say union rates for your actors yeah. or your your extras well, or whatnot. That that has a, a monetary fee that you can't really put a number on. Well, you can, was it but but easier to do it there. Yes. Oh yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, because because like I mean, actors unions. Not to mention just like the the more traditional like unions like carpenters and tradesmen and stuff like okay. that, electrician and whatnot. Um, that's that's um just not an issue you just hire dudes to do it and you just pay them by the hour and like and you know it's like we need this done we need this done by this time for this much can you do it uh and then the guy will be like oh yeah i think so and then he just does it and it, that helps it, yeah i mean it's just it's just a lot more of a uh Com- culturally it's complimentary to your cause yeah somebody yeah. says it's, they're gonna do something they it, handle it it's good it's good for filmmaking like i'd say um i think that you know what it's um i don't understand like like I'm a, I, I come from an animation background, right? Mm-hmm. Like I, I do like, I used to do like animation and like digital effects and, and shit like that for, for commercials and stuff. Um, and uh, I feel like those, like me, like, like these kinds of people are the ones who really need unions to, to protect, to protect them, you know? Whereas like, whereas like actors and stuff, it's like an actor, like what are you doing? You're just standing around and, and, eating food you know meanwhile like um puppets just these guys who are these guys who are fucking uh <laughs> sitting behind their computer and like and just trying to make a buck and, and constantly trying to like outbid each other and stuff mm-hmm. i mean uh, but there's it, it's so difficult to to get them to come together and and uh but and try to get sort of workers rights or, or something like that yeah but, but you, you know what the the film was that really from my from my understanding the film that really affected uh actors unions and and rights and all that was uh twilight zone uh the john landis segment where they had the the accident with the uh helicopter coming down i remember watching that interview decapitating he's smoking through the whole interview it's he, they got Twilight Zone discussing the whole business and stuff. Well, well no, but do you do you do you, do you remember the accent? So they I do. They made a Twilight Zone movie back in the eighties. Yeah, helicopter and, crash. Uh, the something? helicopter yeah. crash, and he's carrying two young kids mm. through like this knee deep water, and a helicopter's overhead, and it crashed yeah. uh, unfortunately, and, and and decapitated two of them and crushed the other one. And so, but those kids technically shouldn't have been working at that late at night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they shouldn't have been doing that. It should have been stunt actors. So it was that accident that really then kind of changed the um wild uh, west of the, filmmaking the, yeah like that's when the actors unions like stepped in and said okay this is how things have to 
unfold and have to go down. It had nothing right? to do with that chariot race where they killed all those horses in that. No, oh, they have horses. No, that's that's not a that's not a, a, an actor's issue. No, because yeah. they're horses. They're yeah. non-humans. Do you know the difference between horses and? No, okay. I, I like okay. go to Denmark for a reason. Bestiality is still a thing <laughs> over there. I know yeah. it is. It's insane. It is crazy. Those sex farms. They put my pictures on the wall in two of them. And I haven't even come in the place yet. I just hang out. I'm good for business, I yeah. think. They, they, say, they call that, the, the best ones they call just the right height, no bucket required. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I bring a stepladder because I don't like rejection. So I like to get everything from a giraffe down to a, a local weasel. Um, have you ever fucked any animals? Not lately. No, <laughs> no. That's disturbing. No, nah, I'm sorry. I've seen sorry. those movies. Well, I mean, you know, not including my ex-wife. <laughs> you know what I mean? Whoa. Oh, hey. were, you, were you married? Uh, no, that was, I'm just joking. That was a nice no. little uh, Rodney Dangerfield there. Yeah. I like that. Thank you. That's that's good. Long live Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> yeah. Now that's a comedian. Uh, one yeah. thing I, I wanted to ask you about your film uh, <laughs> was how fucking good the prosthetic effects are. And yeah, it, the trailer was crazy. Uh, have you, have and, you, not, and have you the, not seen the film, He hasn't Jason? seen the film no, yet. No, okay. I don't even... He, he's the seen Bob it tonight. Wire thing is the only thing that I've heard. Right. Andrew says, I don't mind telling you, I want you to see this. Yeah, he so he's coming to the screening tonight. Okay. It's scandalous and uh, very politically incorrect. Well, <laughs> like, here, here's the thing. To me, it's one of these movies that, like, if we'd, uh, if you'd shot it here in North America, people would be possibly jump down your throat but, but you have a bit of a, a hall pass the fact that it was made in Asia mm, but I, uh, I, I ran into a lot of like a, a lot of uh, content related roadblocks yeah but um, I luckily I just had a good relationship with my financer the guy who was paying for everything was just like like we are we are doing this you know I, or, or he That's sometimes great. sometimes he would like actually push me to go further he'd be like fucking show it don't don't do the thing where you just show the shadow on the wall like actually show the thing and I was like like don't I don't want you to think that I'm afraid to. It's just that I think that this will work better for the film if we did it like kind yeah. of a little more implicitly because you can you'll retain the the terror of the situation, but you're not giving like the Twitter mob anything to like actually point at. So I think that it's it's better to do it this way. And I'd explain stuff like that to him. He'd be kind of like, ah, fuck whatever. Yeah, fine. El <laughs> Elbert, Elbert Hitchcock. The shadow, the knife. You never actually yeah, yeah. see the, her being stabbed in Psycho. But, but again, uh, that was also uh, that was like that was just an. Uh, 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 and, and like a result of the time that the film was made, um, but anyways, but yeah, the, the the prosthetic effects, the blood and everything was was phenomenal. Is that all local? Is, 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 yeah, that's what I want to know. Yeah. Like, do they have like good VFX or uh, makeup effects teams in Taiwan, or well, did you have to import someone in for that? It's just like I was saying about like the actors, right? Like, it's like you're finding you're just finding some people who. You talk with them and you kind of look at their work and you don't really see what you need in their existing work, but you kind of, you spend enough time with them and you kind of sort of can see the potential and then you just kind of roll the dice and, and just try to find the, because it was IF, SFX art maker, uh, Victor and Esther, how you doing? Nice to see you. Um, and uh, they were, uh, they were just these kids who, you know, they, they did, they did the, VFX or not VFX I did the same thing they did like the makeup effects for um, for like the local TV productions and, and mostly like they would just have to do like you know maybe a corpse for like a, a uh, like a procedural like a cop procedural yeah. or like maybe they had to do some someone get their hand cut off or Minimal something stuff yeah right? yeah and, and you brought them Pandora's box right and right said, check this shit out yeah and uh, and I they kind of just seemed when I showed them my sketches um, and the storyboards they were just kind of like this looks great, you know, and they, and they, they gave a quote and then I went back to sort of, um, uh, you know, pay, like what do you call that financing or whatever. And they said, Oh, you know, we can only give them this much. And I was like, no, no, I think we should really just pay them what they need, what they ask for and not haggle with them because I need these guys to have like a good, On point. A, a good attitude. And like, I need them to, to feel like they're respected because they're actually like the, the, one of the stars of the film. So then, so I went back and I said, okay, we're going to give you what you want, what you asked for. And they said, cool. And then, and then they just, they just came correct, like, and it—it it, it was really. Well, right. It's, no, and, and no. Kudos to you, dude, for having that fucking insight on your first feature <sighs> to do that, because a lot of people on their first feature would would just kind of maybe kowtow down to the producer and go, "Okay, if you don't want to spend yeah. that money, fine, sure." But you you fought for what you needed, well, and that's the way the way I see it is, um, like I I've always felt like I could do a movie, like even when I was like in my twenties, but I just kind of it just seemed so difficult to like go through the motions of like getting funding and like and finding actors and I've never been good with like working with people either like 
really bad with like um like not not bad like i i I can talk with people and like I, yeah. I, I get along. I'm, You're talking I, to us now. I, I like to think of myself as gregarious, uh, as they say. Yeah. However, um, uh, in terms of like managing people and stuff and like and kind of working, working with a team, I'm just because I'm an animator, right? Like you do yeah. everything yourself and you tend to micromanage a lot as well. Um, and I just thought like, oh, I, this this maybe isn't for me being a director. But then uh, when I got the opportunity, I, um, I just uh, I kind of just thought like, OK, well, I'm probably not going to be able to do this again. Like, I'm probably not going to get this opportunity again unless I do this. Uh, so I thought I'd just give it a shot. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I it just kind of seemed to me like, like I said, like I just kind of felt like I could do it. And I, and I have a good understanding of, like, storytelling because of, of being an animator. I have a good understanding of, like, timing and rhythm. I, I'm, a, I'm a huge film nerd. So, like, I mean, I know what I like. I know how things work and I understand how the engine works and everything. Like, I know where, what all the parts of the engine are. And uh, as far as, like, special effects, like, you know, I'm... I'm big into like I've I don't do that myself, but like I understand the uh, mechanics of right, it. yeah, the, just the, the general the general sort of broad strokes of it, and I know sort of what needs to happen. What are the what's imp, what's unreasonable to ask? What's reasonable to ask when someone's bullshitting me? When I should push? When I should be diplomatic? Mm -hmm. And uh, that that's kind of I guess. And the same thing is true about um, VFX too, because I I did all the VFX for the sadness myself, so we kind I kind of shot it with like you know, me doing it in mind, you know, yeah, like, I know. Like kind of like, like, okay, so I have to do this. Yeah. So I'm going to try to make it as easy as possible. And, um, I, I should also mention that I did have a, a guy who helped, uh, named Logan Sprangers from Los Angeles, who, uh, was sort of a, an, I wouldn't say assistant. I'd say it was like a 50, 50 thing. I shouldn't say I did it all myself. Um, he helped a lot and, but I did it. I, I, uh, designed all of the, the VFX and, and all the sort of the fantastic stuff in the film to be kind of like, um, you know, manageable by just like a couple of guys, you know, mm -hmm. because that's what it was going to be. It was going to be a couple of guys. So then, um, so I guess maybe that's just it. Like I'm a, I'm a kind of a, uh, a craftsman, like I, I'm more than an artist, I'd say sometimes. Like I just I think about sort of the, mov the movie, like when I'm writing a movie, I'm thinking about like, how exactly is this going to work? Like, you know, if it, oh, okay. Like if this is, uh, if, if the whole thing hinges upon like the little girl being creepy, um, Maybe that's a bad idea because where am I going to find that little girl who's going to be able to pull this acting off? Like, you know, okay, maybe we need to take a few steps back. Um, how, you know, cause you know what I'm saying? Like there's one, this one thing. That's a lot of plates spinning in your head. That's exactly right. That's, it's exactly like that. Yeah. It's all, it all has to kind of work together. And if it doesn't, if it all doesn't work together, then it's, it, it just all falls apart. Yeah. It starts to capsize very quickly. So you have to be kind of a, a technician. I, this, this is why I think that James Cameron is such a, a, a impeccable director is because he he knows he understands the technical aspects of of uh, filmmaking modern filmmaking as I think as well as like he understands sort of the dramatic stuff too um yeah i think and i think that uh, probably i wouldn't say he's like my my favorite director but i i have you know a, a, an extremely high amount of respect for for james cameron mm -hmm. there's a great podcast called uh, blockbuster have you heard of it no it's it's it, they 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 do a a, a narrative uh, story of James Cameron's life uh, that was season two. It's actually worth listening to. Sure. Yeah. Do you think that your background in animation helped you create universes from scratch in your mind? Um, maybe not my background in animation, but maybe just sort of like, um, uh, just you know, like I, I before the animation, there was a lot of like just a lot of drawing, a lot of making comics and stuff. And I mean, just as a kid, like not even, yeah. not even like professionally, but like it, it, it with me, it was always like <clears throat> just doing a drawing and just being like, here's, here's my beautiful drawing was never enough. It was like, yeah. here's like, a, here's like this monster. And then it's kind of like, okay, well, you know, and let's make more monsters and creating an entire world. Yeah, like give it, him a job. That right. monster needs a job. Sure, he sure. Needs a job, and monster he needs, job. And he needs like a little house, you know. Yeah. And he needs like a, a guy Crazy to fight. Car. He needs some weapons. He needs yeah. some like some accoutrement and stuff. Yeah. Going and, through a divorce. Sure, sure. He's going through a, a, a real nasty divorce. <sighs> Bad one. Uh, yeah. And then, um, yeah, so like it, like creating worlds, just creating worlds was just like if I'm going to put pencil to paper, it's like it's beginning the creating the creation of a world. You know, that's kind of always. The way it was, because because doing anything less seemed like a waste of time. Sure, you're drawing stickers, at that. If not, you know. Yeah. yeah oh yeah. I see. Yeah. 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 Basically, it's just like there's no point to this. So I mean that that that's not even. I'd like to. I wish I could talk more about like my my professional career. My professional career prior to the sadness is pretty, just like, 
you know, independent like webtoons and like commercials, like and and corporate animation and stuff. Like, a, how does it feel to come out the other side with something you've done yourself uh, and held this thing along, and now it's birthed? I don't know yet, actually, because yeah. it's so it's so early in the in the game, and and I've only. I've only, you know, like you win one award. I won an award at Fantasia for like best first director, right? Yeah. Oh, well, we were first talking film. about Fantastic, Fantastic Fest, Fest and uh, and and Fright in Fest London. not being what you expected. Well, like, that's the thing. Like Fright Fest, sorry, Fantastic Fest. When I've gone to it in previous years, it's like it's jam, like a con. It's jam packed with people. Yeah, the people are selling T-shirts and and Blu-rays, and it's like it's, signings. Yeah, you can barely get through the the crowd. And this year, it's it's. Uh, it's a bit of a ghost town there. The, yeah. on, the only, uh, though. The only um, uh, festival that I felt kind of like was, ha- you know, that was kind of cool like that. I mean, it, it wasn't like a con, but at least, like I said, I was saying, it's like you, le- you get up in the morning and you leave your hotel and you have some place to go and to yeah. just sort of hang out and talk with people and like and have a beer. And, you know, you get in because you have a wristband or whatever. And, That's the best part. Yeah. And then, um, uh, but like Motel X in, in Lisbon was really nice mm. for that. Um, although like it, it was pretty, it, it was also very low key, but I mean, Lisbon is such a nice town that, um, you know, it was forgivable, but yeah, like fucking, uh, Fright Fest in the UK, it was just really just about the films. It was just about the screenings. And, they stripped it all back to just the basics. Yeah. Yeah. I also should say too, that I had a, a really nice time at, uh, the Calgary International Film Festival, which is like a film festival that like, it, it's not like one of these big, cool festivals. It's just sort of like, okay, uh, Cal- you know, I heard of Calgary, sure. And they, and they were very kind and they invited me to come out and um and they had they had like functions through the day like they just had little like Calgary's know, l- nice yeah like luncheons like and like and like you know four o'clock happy hours and yeah. stuff and like it was it was really cool and like I, I felt like I was very like kind of care of exactly like taken yeah. care of and kind of like they were happy I was there yeah. you know whereas there are some festivals where it's like you don't really feel like they're super stoked that you're there they're you're just they're, quota yeah, yeah exactly like it's like for sponsors right like they they fucking um what do you call it? They they make the festival and then we we provide all of the content and the draw and then they don't even like you know give us an open bar like you know at yeah, five no o'clock. Yeah, no per diem or nothing. No, fuck these festivals. Stop Did, it. Pay your artists, you piece of shit. I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that. I I'm just I have I'm, nothing to lose. I'm I'm just trying to say that uh, it's it's nice when you feel. Like w- welcomed, like yeah. welcomed, you know. Yeah, the, 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 the festival is making its back a off gift of the bag artists. in your hotel room with stuff you'll probably never use. But yeah, yeah, yeah. A- I mean, yeah, like I, I got to say, like uh, Motel X was a was a very nice festival, and like I uh, was very happy to be. I, I've been happy to be, to be invited to all these festivals. Yeah. Actually, Fantasia was also is always also did, just awesome. Did you go to Sitges? I'm going. Well, it's not. It's not. Oh, that's going right. On yeah, yet. it's coming up. I but, am. I am going there. Yes. Fuck. And tonight, your movie is playing at the Alamo Draft House. Here in Austin, Texas. Affirmative. That's so wicked. I'm stoked. And, Is that and, and, seven o'clock? Yeah, seven o'clock. And seven it's o'clock. won best film and best director of the best fest. film, best so director. It's 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 going to be uh, sold out screening uh, for sure. And uh, the fact that Andrew's oh. excited about it, I'm I'm a little nervous because I'm going to be super excited. You're going to. I'm going to pee in a cup. Uh oh. Well, you... I think we're going to have a piss off. Me and you locked arm in arm, yeah. front row, piss cups. Uh, what if we put attached like a hose to like our dicks catheters and then and then, then yeah like we'll see who can pee harder oh I've been like, doing it's like a piss tug, tug of war it's like a push of war you know well, no, that's... what you should do you should put a hose on each end of your dick uh-huh. and that way it's like you're pissing into the other guy's piss hole that's, ex- like, you know, that's exactly what I just said yeah well oh, is that what you said yeah, yeah. yeah we're gonna piss okay. against each other and yeah. see who's got okay sorry I wasn't I'm I was gonna only have half to tape off this is, we're, we're going we're coming round about to like the thing we were saying earlier where it's like you know you come up with an idea and then the other guy comes up with the idea and he's just kind of like i got the idea you know but really you we, already came we, up with the idea and, we, and yeah. i came up with it right in front of him too can you imagine that this is the creative process you're always going to end up with a rubber hose full of piss i came up with that idea uh, okay that's <laughs> business uh the music and the sadness uh-huh yeah yeah how'd you pick that i was um i just went on soundcloud and i found this uh this group called Suchar from uh, Singapore. Oh, they're based in they're based in Australia in Melbourne, but they're uh, Singaporean. Uh, a couple, a Singaporean couple, and um, I just got to talking with them, and uh, we we kind of connected over metal because we both we both really like um, metal, mm. but at the same time, he doesn't make metal. Like it, it, it's just sort of this. Um, Overarching influence, you know, and sort of like this. Marty Freeman from Megadeth. 
classically guitar player got hired to play in Megadeth didn't like metal but he can play it mm, I, I think it's I, the, the better sort of maybe the thing that I feel like that make, uh, makes more sense in this uh, case is like um, some guy who makes like techno but then in his free time he's listening to like Wolves in the Throne Room or something or okay. like because or like, yeah. he likes sort of he likes maybe the 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 overarching vibes sure. but it's not really it's the the instruments by which it's playing mm. or by which it's played is not really the, the the issue it's more just about like the vibes and kind of like yeah. you, can, you can get sort of a certain like vastness from s- certain kinds of metal expect, especially like atmospheric black metal and stuff yeah. Love and, there's, that. and there's also sort of like this really like um like with a lot of like grindcore and and uh slam and stuff you, like there's just there's a lot of like it, intricacy and and just technical like it's almost like just uh, doing math in your head yeah you know uh and faceless I, is good at that sure sure there's this one called um visceral disgorge that mm. that's a really great uh technical yeah like a technical slam band and and of course gore pot here's the plug gore pot. larry larry fucking get that on spotify gore pot yeah that's a it's a hell of a band with, with a lot of like like you don't really find a lot of like comedy in in gore grind necro goblin yeah but that that's like that's kind of like that's different okay that, that, it's a, it's more kind of a gimmick you know okay um this is more i, I don't, this just feels more just wild and, yeah. and weird but um regarding uh tuchar uh we just kind of hollered at i just hollered at the guy and i said hey man do you want to do this soundtrack for this film and he said uh Okay, well, let's talk about it. Can you give me the script? And we just talked about it. And he, and then they did all these notes in the script. They were like all original music. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, they did. They also did like a song uh, at the end. And also, I got a local Taiwanese oh, so band. That was him who did the song at the end. The uh... not not the not the first song. Like when oh, okay, the, like during not during the end credits, like the end credit during the, song? during the single card credits. Uh, the single card credits d- immediately after the film is a band called Ashen, which is a local okay. Taiwanese band that uh, I just thought was the right band to kind of end the film because they're just one of those bands that like have like, been around for like 13 years. Like Melt Banana? No, no, not, not like Melt, not, not like <laughs> Japanese Melt Banana. They, they're, they're Melt Bananas. They're crazy. I love yeah, Melt Banana. Me too, me too, absolutely. Crazy. Uh, Tuchar, Ming from Tuchar, huge Melt Banana fan. Okay. But, um, but I will say that um, uh, the thing about that band <laughs> is that is that they've been around for like 13 years yeah. or, or more in Taiwan and they, they just never really, they've never really gotten anywhere and i feel like that's that's kind of the beauty of of a lot of things like metal is that you uh you just do them or you know you just do them because you just you can't not do them like you're just you're just so in love with with the with the work that you just you you stick with this band that's kind of just like eating up all your time and like eating your money you have to pay for studio space and like instruments and stuff just because it's just like and it really stays your hobby for year like decades and you're not really getting anywhere with it but you you're never gonna break up the band yeah. because because it's just what you like doing so and the, uh Dar- so I, dario argento and goblin yeah, yeah is it that kind of relationship uh because goblin did all the music for his films but they never had any they never even did a live show but they were this legendary band go- that did go- all his goblin has done live shows has before. they done live yeah. shows yeah they've they've definitely played live uh, i think that there's been more of an interest in it like recently like okay. I, I was gonna say i think they they did more live shows after the fact yeah, the, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, that they they grew in cult status as a result of argento's films yeah. but cool. uh, but no but like to what you're saying though like usually as an artist you do what you you do because you love doing it and making money doing it is just icing on the cake no i i understand i understand that but it's like um I, I don't know, I guess just kind of like with, I just like, I just like these bands that, that just stay together and keep make, keep doing metal. And, and it, metal is like sort of like an anvil, sort of an, an unpopular sort of style of music. Like it doesn't really get you, chi- <clears throat> it doesn't really get you chicks no, or anything. No, I've been so, to a King Diamond concert, but my brother is 12 years younger and I go, take a look. You don't get into this for the pussy. Right. Not one chick. I mean, back, back in like the LA days of like, you know, yeah, Liz, Lizzie Borden, or like just these these uh, L.A. Uh, what, yeah. what's that? The Whiskey A Go Go or whatever yeah. that well, fucking the, the, thing is. The Poisons mm. and Cinderellas and yeah. all those bands. That, those days Rats. are long. Those days are long gone. And then, and then crew, of we, we move into like the sweatpants days of like Cannibal Corpse, and like you know those sweatpants got piss on them, and you're not going to get any chicks, right? But the thing is, is that so that's why I like about metal is that it's, you go to the show, it's just all dudes, and it's just kind of like we just really like this this music, and for you know, against all odds, you know, for no good reason. Mm-hmm. And so I just, I really wanted to, cause I'm a metal guy. Like 
you know, I, I, I am like, I, I, that's just the only music that I can really kind of relate, yeah. relate to. And, and, uh, the sadness to me kind of is a metal movie, although there's not really any metal in the soundtrack, but I just kind of wanted to highlight that with a band from Taiwan that I thought was like, just really hanging, hanging on and, and really d true, like, like a good, just a good true metal band. And then finally, uh, Tsuchar closes out the film with kind of this weird, heavy sort of Chinese ballad that they, uh, that they wrote at the end. So there's only two pieces of like two songs in the movie. And then, and then the original score is all done by Tsuchar. And, um, and, uh, yeah, to, to just to, to your point again about like the goblin or, or, and Dario Argento or like Tim Burton and, and Danny, what's his name? Danny Glover, Elf, Danny, Elfman? Danny <laughs> not, Elfman. Da not Danny Glover, uh, <laughs> Tim Burton and Danny. So Tim Burton and Danny Glover, um, uh, they, uh, they, they're kind of just these sort of director and, and composer combos mm. uh, I, I had a really great relationship working with with Ming and, and Sarah from Tsuchar and I think that if we do another film like they'll definitely get the first look I, I think that like pretty much everybody in the sadness is this your Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross uh, but that was kind of like later right like that mm. was like because you know, Trent Reznor did all this stuff and he kind of like retired into like the Atticus Ross days you know yeah it's weird and, it, and it's like Trent it Reznor yeah, I like it, but it's weird for sure. Clint Manzel is another one. Him and uh, uh, Darren uh, Aronofsky. Aronofsky, yeah, yeah, because uh, you know he he used to, he would do music for Pop Will Eat Itself, which was never really a, a huge British band. No, they were they, cool though. They did, yeah, yeah, of course they were cool. They did great, but yeah, they they bumped Nothing into each records. other at a, at a New York party and. Uh, I like and the that. Rest is history. I like that album called Dos Didos Mi Amigos. Remember that record? It mm -hmm. was it was like from maybe like nineteen ninety eight. Pop, that eight? was Pop Will Eat Itself. Yeah. Oh shit. I think I Front Two one. Four is playing this weekend. Front, front Two Four Two. Front yeah. Two Four Two. Belgian you know, Belgian band. You know you yeah. know who was you know who was playing yesterday? Who? Uh, or this maybe this week or whatever was three eleven. Ew. <laughs> I saw I saw some guys at the Ew. airport and they were just like I was like uh, they were like, Hey, do you know where the Uber pickup is? And I was just like, Nope. I'm I'm just like you guys. I just got off a plane and they're just like yeah, we're here for the 311 show. And I was just like, whoa, these guys are fucking 311 fans. How about that? Yeah, they're the word, they're right beside Crazy Town fans. Speaking of Crazy Town, uh, thanks uh, for listening, everybody. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, we we're going to wrap it up now. Well, you are, we? are uh, where can people find the website? And is there an Instagram for the film? Not for, like, uh, follow me. Like, I mean, there is, like, the sadness 2021, like, yeah. one all one word is... Um, the Instagram. And of course, on Raven Banner's account. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, follow Raven you know. Banner. Yeah. And also follow me, Rob Jabaz, R O B J A B B A Z. And uh, you can find me, like, I'm most active probably on Instagram. And if you want to fo follow me on Twitter, it's Jabaz Rob, because I tried to open Rob Jabaz like a while ago, but then I just didn't use it and then I forgot the password. I know, I hate when that happens. Yeah. So but did, didn't, didn't you have like a, a, a safety net uh, email that you could then recover? No, because I, it? I didn't use that. E like, I forgot what that email thing is, too. And I just forgot yeah. about it. I don't care. It's fine. Okay. Who cares? All it's right. just Twitter. Fuck it. Thanks for watching, everybody. Burn it all to the ground. Burn it all to the ground. And remember, if you're bored, piss in a cup. It's a good way to get fired. Bye. We would like to see most of the human race killed off because it is unworthy. It is unworthy of the gift of life. I don't care what society thinks. They're nothing anyway. They're no better than me. Until we have a safe word, we will not stop. Have you ever thought what it would be like to see a person's head amputated? Think of things so horrible that the human mind cannot imagine them. See all this and more when you see on stage in person that crazy mixed up. I like being set apart from people.